Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. I'm Henry. I'm Danny. I'm Kagan. We're three leftist veterans that aim to expose the reality of the U.S. military's multiple wars abroad and to illuminate the damage military service does to Americans. American presidents throughout U.S. history have used American military and diplomatic power to force regime change of democratically elected governments around the world. Most veterans come from families vested in prior service, and American generals choose their own, ensuring diversity of thought never interferes with American warmongering. How can we stand by and do nothing while our military kills and destroys lives the world over, while telling Americans that all this death and destruction protects them from terrorists when nothing could be more false? Fortress on a Hill aims to change that. So, uh, well, anyway, I'm going to hand it over to Henry because uh, we both know that you and I can go back and forth indefinitely. Uh, so, uh, Henry, why don't you take us uh, forward a little bit? So we've uh, recently seen the suspension of Bernie Sanders' campaign for president, as well as yesterday when it was announced that Bernie had, in fact, endorsed Joe Biden for president. Bob, what has stuck out about you uh, excuse me, suck out to you about Sanders' campaign. Um, what do you think should be the next move of people who support him? And lastly, do you, what path do you see to a viable third party in the U.S. political system? You know, I, I'm very disappointed in what Sanders did because he didn't even wait to see what the platform would be. He didn't even wait to see who the vice presidential pick would be. And he knows of, of Biden's role in creating the, uh, the tragic domestic, forget about foreign policy, because he's got a lot of problems there, but, but the whole banking meltdown the whole foreclosure crisis, the Great Recession, Biden's fingerprints are all over that, and 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 he's not alone. Obviously, uh, Bill Clinton, and then Barack Obama's bailout uh, made the banks whole, and didn't even do what Trump is doing now, which is increase unemployment insurance or some of the governors are doing you can't foreclose and throw people out of their houses or you got to help them pay their rent there was not a word of that from from in in, in practice i mean from biden uh, uh, at that time when he was vice president or from barack obama they took lawrence summers who had been the secretary of treasury under clinton was one of the main if not the main architect of the uh, deregulation of Wall Street that created that whole scandal. So Bernie Sanders' main issue has been the economic uh, uh, wealth gap, the uh, misery of ordinary Americans, the fact that real wages have not really increased in 40 years, the growing class divide in America. And to embrace Biden uh, without getting any concessions at all to the campaign he's run uh why because we have a virus and and with biden as i recall in the debate with bernie uh biden denied that we uh he what did he say he would call out the military to deal with the virus that was his great contribution i assume he meant the more aggressive military than trump has has done uh so i think bernie failed us first time i'm saying that I have great respect for him. I understand the burden of what he's done, but he's caved in to this lesser evil. Uh, what is it? It's a drug, the drug of lesser evilism. And I'm backing into this third party part of your question. Uh, I think lesser evilism is a great trap, a great trap. And uh, it, it just... You know, it means that people have power in this country can throw up one monster, which after all, Donald Trump was a creation of mass media, right? And the Clintons even went to his wedding and they thought he was fun and interesting and adorable. Uh, and uh, 
the issues that he's played on, like immigration and so forth, are issues that were left to fester, whether Democrats were in charge or Republican. We never had a sane immigration policy ever. Uh, and because nobody wanted it. The farmers didn't want it. The exploiters didn't want it. The people who want to have cheap maize didn't want it. Uh, politicians didn't want it. But, you know, the fact of the matter is you get this, you get a Barry Goldwater. That was the one that got uh, LBJ off the hook. Uh, you have a Richard Nixon. He got uh, the Democrats off the hook. You got a Trump. And they're built up into these uncivilized monsters. And then you go with the lesser evil. Well, you know, the so-called lesser evil created a lot of the problems that we're dealing with now. The, certainly the, the prison industrial economy, uh, you know, the, all these people in jail, the millions, had a lot to do with Biden and prison uh, reform under, uh, well, uh, under uh, Clinton, uh, welfare reform, the destruction of the federal poverty program. There are a lot of things Democrats have to be held responsible for, and Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, to a considerable degree on the economic stuff, was holding them accountable. I think for Bernie Sanders to get people all excited about his campaign once again, and not go that extra mile to at least take this fight to a a Democratic convention, however it's held, and to demand concessions on the platform, on the and the choice of a vice president, and so forth, I, I just don't get it. I, I, I you know, uh, hesitant to uh, put Bernie down. I think he's fought the good fight, but it is is deeply disappointing. But look, should I answer your question about the third party? Uh, uh, sure. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm worried about third party. Not that the two parties are going to do any better, but short of a major depression. Okay, let me answer a question that was raised before we got into this and some of the thoughts that uh, Danny uh, connected with me. How do you get social change and what is the role of electoral politics and so forth? And uh, here I will draw upon my 84 years on this earth. Uh, because I am old, I can remember from my childhood, uh, when I was two, three, four years old, that Roosevelt was not doing enough to get us out of the Depression. And this was already his second term. And the stuff that he was doing only became because you had the veterans' marches, you had trade unions emerging, the industrial unions, you had people protesting. Uh, Major Danny said, I was a red diaper baby. Yes, my parents were union activists. My father had been a wobbly. He was something, and then he was a social democrat, and then he flirted with... uh, few months with communists or something. My mother uh, was never that because she had come from the old Soviet Union and she was in a group that opposed the Bolsheviks at the end. But nonetheless, they were working class union people and they would drag me as a little kid down to picket the White House or something. And I can still remember a slogan, open the second front, which meant the U.S. should get involved in the war against Hitler uh, before, you know, the fall of, of, of after it was already after the fall of France, but before England would fall, and uh, and on the economic issues, the uh, Roosevelt did not solve the problems of the Great Depression. World War Two did, you know, and so uh, we were really worried about food, uh, you know, before the war came. When the war in Europe came, okay, then they had to, uh, my parents went to work, you know, making uniforms and everything. And my uh, half-brother got, you know, into the Army Air Force and all that, you know, and people were signing up even early. There were, uh, you know, there was dignity and jobs for working class people and patriotism and what have you. But we never really came to grips with the economic problems of depression. But we did set in motion Uh, certain ideas like Glass-Steagall, which was break up the banks, which, of course, Bill Clinton then destroyed the major economic achievement uh, structurally of of the Roosevelt years. Uh, But, you know, we, we, 
you know, the good things that happened in terms of, of uh, giving us some security and some basis, as Ronald Reagan pointed out, came from the New Deal in response to public pressure. OK, not really third parties. Third parties have had, always had a hard time in America because of the size of the country, the role of mass media, the ability of the rich and powerful people to shape the narrative. So even Eugene Victor Debs, the candidate of the Socialist Party who got a million votes, that's about as good as anyone has ever done. And that's a, a, a century ago and more so. Uh, so it's hard to think about a third party. I think it's more important to think about people speaking up, uh, challenging the narrative, uh, demonstrations, grassroots movements, uh, putting pressure on local politicians. Uh, I think uh, uh, Governor Cuomo and Gavin Newsom are doing a much better job than some others because they come from states where there is an active uh, progressive movement uh, and actually controls a large part of the Democratic Party on the uh, clubhouse level. Uh, and uh, they are doing more of the right thing. And I think what you guys are doing is, is the right way rather than getting caught up in, you know, should we form a third party or not? You should just speak out. And there, I, I say about the Internet, it's the best and worst of all worlds, okay? Yes, people can be manipulated. They can be amused to death. They can be distracted. But the fact is, we're able to do this now with a very small capital investment. You know, I, I say freedom of the press is – A.J. Lieblin, I quote him, the famed media critic for The New Yorker, freedom of the press is guaranteed only to those who own one. Well, on the Internet, with a very small amount of capital, the the four of us can have an interesting discussion. I know I'm going on too long and too much, but, you know, I thank you for letting me sound off. And, and uh, so the fact is, we have, as long as net neutrality is there, as long as, you know, Leonard Cohn said, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets through, the singer Leonard Cohn. You know, well, that's true. There are contradictions. The Internet right now has room for alternative voices. Uh, and that's why we're getting things. You know, I had a pretty good run with Truth Dig and other people, including Major Danny and Chris Hedges, who wrote for it, and the wonderful people who edited it uh it for 15 years and we were able to get a voice well uh it turns out i didn't really own half of it uh, i guess and so it's no longer going to be the same thing uh but uh there are others uh you know other publications and i notice uh, popular resistance and uh danny i think you've written for the nation so That's there right. are cracks in the system where you can get the word out and organize and, you know, speaking about Danny, I think you've had a tremendous, I mean, one person, you've had other allies and other people speaking out. But when you consider your productivity and your ability to change the narrative and challenge thinking, uh, I know it's had a big effect on my students and on people I know. I think you've been kind of the major voice and daring, uh, daring to challenge the war narrative, not the only one. But you certainly seized the reins and, and been out there. I don't know how often you write. You almost seem to write every other day, you know, <laughs> and always meaningful. It really is, you know. I know you're down on yourself every once in a while. I know it's not easy to pay your bills and everything. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, uh, you guys, uh, you're doing the right thing. And it could be a trap to get too much caught up in electoral politics where money really talks. It's hard to get the word out there. Look what they did to Jill Stein, for instance, a, a wonderful person, medical doctor, sincere as they come. And, and the Clinton people were able to make her seem like a Putin agent, you know, <laughs> Putin agent. Right. We'll get, we're back with the red baiting, neglecting the fact that Putin was the anti-communist candidate selected by the U.S. Uh, CIA and State Department and everything else to, you know, to take over from Yeltsin uh, because Yeltsin was a hopeful, hopeless drunk. And that's how you 
Putin came to power and he embraced the Russian Orthodox Church and he's a great Russian nationalist. I don't mean a great nationalist, but he's great Russia nationalist in the sense of uh, all their time zones. And, uh, you know, that's what he is. He's like Castro. He's another nationalist and we can't abide anybody having their own a view and challenging American hegemony. So he's demonized now. And anybody who goes, ha- attends a function like Jill Stein did, where he's at, oh man, they must be a, a commie agent. Only he's not a commie. He's an anti commie. He defeated the communists in his elections and does every time. There is a communist party still there and he defeats them. And he was the one, the flavor of the month that the US liked. Only he didn't march to our drummer and now they demonize him. That's been the whole history of the Cold War, with or without communists in power. I, I know I'm no. talking too much, but you know, hell, I welcome the opportunity, but challenge me if I'm wrong. I mean, I'm not, you know, uh, when Major Danny has been in my class, he, he doesn't let me get in a word edgewise, so I don't know what's going on here, Danny. Oh well, you know, I, I like I, I like to try to let my co-hosts uh, co-hosts ask their questions. That they could tell you that uh, many times I dominate the uh, oh, the, oh. the entire space. So I'm well, I'll get, stay as Katie long as you, I'll stay as long as you want, and you can cut out all the earlier part. I don't give a damn. But you know, uh, so tell me what you think. Yeah, go well, ahead, I Katie. just uh, yeah, I just wanted to say you know I totally agree with you. Like. It, it really bothers me that we tend to look at, when it comes to our politics, we, we always want to look at a savior. We want to look at that one person and say, you know, what, in, the, in terms of Trump, we want to say everything that's bad with America is because of Trump, you know, or um, which, again, like you said, allows Democrats to be off the hook, which really pisses me off to no end because it's like, yes, this is bad, but like everything that we've done has culminated in this moment. Like Trump isn't the problem. He's the product of this system that we've created. And uh, so in, you mentioned this um, in your podcast the other day, but also today um, that we have the chance right now to change society for the better. Uh, as far as we we are exposing these really big flaws in our system and we have the chance to really change them. But it could also become much more authoritarian. I mean, with whenever anybody talks about contract tracing, to me, that really bothers me because I worked in the intelligence community and we worked with metadata a lot. And that's how we knew, you know, when people were making phone calls, who they were talking to, how to get a hold of them, their patterns of behavior, blah, blah, blah. And like that kind of stuff freaks me out because we already do use that to a certain extent domestically. But like this virus just makes the opportunity for that kind of work even more dramatic. And that really scares me. So I'm just wondering, do you think that we could instead of going that more authoritarian route, do you think that there are some significant changes we could make for the better? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking about what you just said because I think it's, it's the big truth out there is most people think of individual freedom as a luxury, uh, as something you can have as long as it doesn't sacrifice their need for shelter, their sense of security, their acquisition of wealth. Uh, And so as long as it doesn't challenge those other things, uh, you know, then yes, we should have freedom. And the core element, and that means political freedom, you know, the right to dissent, the right to challenge and so forth. But that kind of political freedom in every society, people are quite willing in the main to sacrifice uh, with with very, very minor reasons of security or instability and so forth. And the freedom that they want to hold on to is more an illusion of freedom. They don't want the stormtroopers banging on their door. Uh, this was the tension, by the way, between uh, a, a Brave New World, Huxley's book, and Orwell's 1984. 
and and Brave New World was written before the war, before the jackboots and and then communism, and Huxley was written after. I believe 49 or 48 was when it was published. And and Huxley's is the overt totalitarian model. Huxley's was using information and lulling us and bribing us and consumerism and, uh, you know, distracting us and gaining control of us. They were two different models. And Huxley actually was asked by Orwell's publisher when 1984 came out to a comment on it. And he said that he understands why Huxley went with that overt totalitarian image. But he said I, he still thought his brave new world uh, a consumerist uh, softer totalitarianism would be the more dangerous, effective one, because it's more effective. And I think we're seeing that tension. Uh, we, we know we don't want stormtroopers. And we know, you know, we don't even really want torture. And when it's when we're forced to look at it, well, we, we want to get walk away from it. Uh, and we don't really want a lot of people in jail, uh, particularly if they look like us and have the same skin color and uh, background, uh, then we don't want to imprison everyone. Uh, and so the real struggle gets to be, uh, uh, how can you take risk out of life? How can you provide order how can you provide some sense of security? Uh, and what model of coercion is acceptable? Because there are risks in life. There are tensions. If people don't have food, they're going to demonstrate. If the climate changes radically and there's flooding, people are going to be upset. Wars create refugees and victims, and they have anger, and uh, or they have needs, so that destabilizes other societies. Uh, so I can go down the whole list of things that go awry. And, and then the question is, do you think that freedom, political freedom, not consumer freedom, debates, uh, challenging, checks and balances, limitations on power, are a way of, not a luxury, but a way of making government more efficient, more effective, right? That's what these reporters are relying on in questioning Trump aggressively. They hope the public will understand that holding powerful people accountable is necessary to efficiency. However, powerful people can usually argue that holding them accountable gets in the way of efficiency and that they can make the trains run on time, and that these other people are nuisances and get in the way. And unfortunately, the people of power, when they can deliver a measure of order and discipline and the trains will run on time, usually win out. That's what happened in the most complex, advanced, uh, individualistic, society in a way of Germany between the wars and the great mystery to me and always talking to my German relatives is how did they go for this not all of them but most of them kind of accepted right uh, whether they were in the Nazi party or not and I have found in traveling around the world whatever society is called uh, most people go along with the totalitarian model, if it's delivering uh, tranquility to them, if it's delivering a sense of order, if it's delivering material possessions, if it's giving them the basic necessities of life and more, uh, toys, trinkets, amusement, and so forth. And I think the endangered species in this world, the most endangered, is the notion of individual freedom. And, and this real, a meaningful sense of it. I don't mean the freedom to shop, although shopping for books is an important freedom or choice of uh, music or movies. Yes, that's important. But in the main, the freedom to act, to uh, assemble for redress of grievances, to vote in meaningful elections, to have your voice heard. And I suspect that's a small minority in this world that really wants that, will fight for it, will support it. So at the heart of, of your question about basically what are we to do 
is we have an uphill battle to convince people that freedom makes us more effective as a society. For example, the wars that you guys fought in, if we had not wasted the enormous resources, both in lives and but actual wealth and productivity and so forth on those wars, as Donald Trump has pointed out, the, the waste in Iraq could have supported a heck of a lot of improvement of education, job training, child care in this country, you know. Uh, and the fact that most of, uh, you know, half of our discretionary federal bu budget is still spent on the military uh, is, is just all you really need to know. And now he is going to have a challenge. He says he wants to build highways and do all this infrastructure. Lots of luck getting that money. Uh, it's going to be a lot more difficult than getting it for an increase in military spending, particularly if you have some war scene breakout somewhere like China seizing some island, uh, boom, then you'll suddenly have the spigots wide open. So I think we should not get trapped in too much discussion about third party, second party. We should just find our voice and use whatever opportunity we have to have that voice heard. And it should be a voice of common sense, of decency, of fairness, and, you know, I think, uh, unfortunately, you had in the last election a choice between a populist of the right and a populist of the left. And the populist of the left, Bernie Sanders, got destroyed by the Democratic Party machinery and the Hil Hillary Clinton, Clinton machine. And the populist voice of the right, which is inherently a demagogic, racist, uh, mean-spirited voice uh, of the kind that produces fascism, that carried the day. But at least it was a voice and remains a voice of concern about how ordinary people are hurting. You get Joe Biden running in, and, and he's only going to talk about the good old days under Obama. He ain't going to make it, you know, because the good old days under Obama were not good for people who lost their homes, lost their jobs, or have to settle for minimum wage jobs because the good jobs have gone elsewhere, okay? And if Biden is up there just to tell you, I want to bring back the glory days of Obama, he's going to lose in, in a very big way. A lot of young organizations have said as much in their letters to him. And uh, I, yeah, I totally agree with you. But I think there's an aspect of this, you know, if we are seeing the federal governments um, fail or, or at least not do its job as well as intended, we're seeing states start to pick up some of that slack. And I, like, I, I mean, Henry and I live in Portland area. And so, um, you know that like our three states here on the West Coast, we're trying to do like this pact um, to help deal with the coronavirus, but also helping open up our economies. And then I heard that the the like the Northeast is kind of doing the same thing. There's a couple of states in there that are trying to figure out their own kind of pact. So I and and I don't feel like we can't just like put that genie back in the bottle once this thing is all over. So. We're, we're, we're starting to come up with some new systems and some new ways of doing things that I think could really help at least those peoples in that region. And, and then it's up to like us to say, is this a good thing or is it not? Well, I think that's the way to go. I mean, even Trump has to defer to that. Uh, the fact is that's what our constitution is all about. And, uh, uh, you know, we've seen states' rights used as, in a reactionary way, obviously, with <laughs> racial segregation and everything. But we are seeing it as an incubator of better ideas, as an alternative. I think, you know, I would be very excited if Gavin Newsom were running for president uh, because I, I really respect what he's been able to do in a, in a short term in California uh, and uh, educate the public keep a sense of balance, be concerned about homeless people as well as affluent people when it comes to the medical treatment. You know, uh, uh, I think we've seen some come out of uh, in other areas. Uh, and uh, 
Yes. Uh, and even Trump has to pay lip service to that because, after all, that was what the Republican Party uh, of late has so po supposedly believed in when it supports reactionary <laughs> ideas and, you know, uh, merging religion and state and everything. They get very excited about states' rights. But I think you put your finger on it. And, and on the local level, by the way, third parties can have a lot of influence. Uh, if you're talking about, you know, because first of all, very often the mayor's races are nonpartisan, but even in statewide races, they can withdraw enough from one party to punish it for not taking a principal position. And I believe in local, local. Uh, the problem is when local forgets that the international is local, you know, as you see it when a young person is taken off to war, whatever the basis of bribing them or rewarding them, you know, then it comes back uh, in a body bag, this person, or comes back to haunt you and uh, an injured veteran or and then loss of resources or what have you. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I love the spirit of, of the Northwest, frankly. Uh, my, my relatives up there live, I don't want to out them and get them in trouble, but they actually live close to where the Ku Klux Klan uh, used to be in Medford. Grants Pass and down there, and uh, but I love that spirit. And uh, you have, uh, I don't know, I want to go on a limb, but I think you got pretty good senator there. It was was very good on the surveillance issues on our whistleblowers. I think uh, you know, there's always been a battle in the Northwest. This is probably not a tangent you really want to go on, but I remember. It, do you remember Scoop Jackson in Washington? Anybody? No, I don't oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, so you remember that he was a real warmonger. <laughs> yeah, big, and, uh, big time cold warrior, big time. Yeah, yeah. And he, but I spent time up there with him. This is before the state of Washington had gourmet restaurants. So the idea of a great meal was a, a piece of salmon that had been cooked and smoked so long it tasted like a piece of wood, you know. Uh, and uh, But nonetheless... It had a spirit, sort of the parts of the Midwest, a good part of the Midwest. Everybody forgets Iowa, Idaho was where the Wobblies were, and, you know, uh, Coeur d'Alene also was where the right wing was. But that spirit of challenge, and, and I'm really proud of California in that respect. I think we have, uh, you know, we never had really a strong Democratic Party structure. We always had a grassroots uh, movements and so forth. And I think uh, in these those three states that you mentioned, uh, there really is a, a capacity for an alternative. Uh, and, uh, and particularly, how do you bring security to people? And I'll tell you, let me give you a few good examples of the positive of the current moment. You know, and Donald Trump has been forced to embrace these ideas because of his idea of getting us out of this economic, you know, we're in a very dangerous moment. We could go off into the worst depression and maybe the depression that would end everything, you know, uh, because a lot of it is on expectation. And and uh, people start to think, hey, get my money out of the market and sell anything and sell my house and get my cash supply and bury it out in my vegetable garden. And at least I can buy some bread. The whole system collapses. It's all an illusion. The Federal Reserve is an illusion. The dollar is an illusion. You know, but illusions work as long as people buy into it, right? Federal Reserve is releasing trillions of dollars. Well, it's the same trillions that they use to buy up the lousy debts from the banks to make them whole, you know, so they could be releasing these trillions to once again make the banks whole. Well, banking earnings are coming in and they're pretty damn good. So they don't they can't even justify that well what we're seeing now is something that i have not seen since i was a kid in the great depression okay and what we're seeing now is a tremendous wellspring of, of energy on this government because it's run by a, a billionaire but really it doesn't matter who's in that they better not do it the same way they did it under obama you better not be spending all this money, a lot more money, and not making at least a good number of us whole. 
Okay, and the a decision to put in uh, what is it, six hundred dollars more for the next four months of unemployment insurance? You know. Uh, yes, yeah, that's it. Six hundred. Yeah, and that means you know. Uh, I mean, I know a lot of my friends and relatives are going on it right now. Well, that means adding that to what in some states is 200, 300, 400. That's giving you, you know, a, a, a reasonable income that you can pay your rent and feed your family. That is one of the biggest, you know, if they have to extend it, if we don't get better and they extend that for nine months, we'll have one of the greatest uh, income redistribution mechanisms that we've had uh that in other words you lose your job and this finally they've got oh you lost your job it's not your fault you can't blame the virus on the workers inefficiency or you know lack of enthusiasm or moral outlook no even donald trump has had to say front and center at every press conference that the clerk in that grocery store you know were working at walmart if they lose their job, it's not their fault. If they're working for a small business, it's not their fault. And and that we got in this bailout. And yes, there was good pressure from the Democrats. I'm not going to take that away. But there was a 96 to nothing vote in the Senate to do the most socialistic thing that has ever happened in this country. Never in this country has the United States Senate voted for this kind of income redistribution. Now, it's temporary. It's not enough. The crisis is very deep. <clears throat> a lot of people, despite these things that are being done, are going to be very deeply hurt. But I could say, certainly in my lifetime, we have not had this kind of redistribution. And the argument, no, people out of work, it's not their fault. And if they're homeless, it's not their fault. Suddenly, we have a different uh, uh microscope we're looking through you know i think that's a big big deal that should be built on you know so in california for instance gavin newsom i know the position of the state is to be against eviction and foreclosure that was not done under obama i wrote columns about that you know uh I, a lot of other people did i said wait a minute you don't even know who owns these mortgages. You don't know how they were sold. You don't know the deception. I mean, look, Wells Fargo, where I've had my mortgages, they've been caught in one crime after another. They didn't even know what they were doing, and they were lying and stealing and cheating, and they've been caught on it, and they pay fines. And they're not alone, a lot of these banks. Okay, so I wrote calm saying, wait a minute, don't throw anybody out of the house. Have a moratorium on mortgage foreclosures. Don't throw anybody out because they can't pay the rent. You know, don't evict them. You know, maybe you subsidize the landlord if they're hurting, but you don't throw people out of their home because they didn't create this problem. Obama, Lawrence Summers, who had what made six uh, million uh, a year uh, from D. Shaw, the hedge fund company, before he was advising Obama, after he was Secretary of Treasury. Robert Rubin, who had been Clinton's first Secretary of Treasury, uh, he went to work uh, right for City uh, Bank, uh, City Group, that was made legal by the reversal of Glass Eagle. They made what you know, uh, uh, ten million a year or something. I mean, incredible uh, amount of money. Uh, for the very bank that he made legit that should have been put out of business, you know, and uh, Obama listened to those people, listened to those people and didn't help anybody stay in their homes, you know, whether renter or owner. And we saw this incredible black people in America. I don't know why it's all this idea that black people should vote for the Democrats under Obama. Uh, according to the Federal Reserve, black people were the hardest hit group because of the housing meltdown. And they lost uh, between 60 and 70 percent of their family wealth. Brown people lost uh, 60 percent of their wealth, not their annual income. Everything their family had managed to gain through the life of that family, you know, all the gains of the civil rights movement economically wiped out, you know. Obama presided over that, listening to Lawrence Summers, listening, uh, you know, to uh, from the side to Robert Rubin. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it's incredible what happened. Okay, under this guy, we're all expected to hate. 
Trump. And yes, there is Democratic pressure. Yes, it came also from Republicans. The fact is the Senate voted 96 to nothing and the House went along and the president signed off on a bill, which it sure gives a lot of money to rich people. But for the first time, it actually helps out many people who are struggling. Not enough and not in enough ways, but it helps them out, you know, and, and just on the fighting the virus. Oh, suddenly uh, Medicare for all. Well, what are they doing? They're saying free tests, right? And if you have the, the illness, your health care is going to be covered if you can't afford it and no co-pays. Well, that's far more radical than what even Bernie Sanders was advocating. You know, uh, boom, that's suddenly, wait a minute, that's socialized medicine. You know, uh, why don't the people on MSNBC at least say that's a victory? You know, it should be for every illness. Yes, it should be for obesity, should be for heart attack, should be for everything. You know, uh, that's universal health care. Because if we don't take care of the homeless person who's got the virus, that's going to spread. Just narrow self-interest says you should do that. Now, why did it wait for Donald Trump to do that? You know, why did it wait for this virus crisis, the big, most fearsome crisis we've ever experienced uh, domestically uh, to do this? You know, uh, but the fact of the matter is they don't even acknowledge this is happening. And it's happening in other ways as well, you know. Uh, and and uh, for suddenly, social justice is in the air. And to answer your specific thing, what's happening in, in Oregon, Washington, and California, and hopefully will happen in New York and, and, and Connecticut and New Jersey uh, and so forth, is a demand from the so-called more progressive democratic states, more progressive states, that we go further than Trump is willing to do, you know, and that the recovery really rebuilds schools and rebuilds uh, health care for poor people, neighborhood clinics, education, you know, helps ordinary people come back whole from this terrible experience. So to answer your question, I think you've come up with the answer. I think that this alliance of so-called progressives, let them really show how progressive they are, you know, and whether it's New York City, whether it's, it's Oregon. Uh, and uh, don't make this a feeding frenzy for already rich people so they can buy more fancy homes outside of Portland. No. Get, get, let, let's, this is, uh, certainly don't want homelessness. Homelessness spreads illness. We know that. You want, can't stay six feet apart when you're on 5th and Main in Los Angeles. That's for sure. You know, and you can't contain it. The great lesson it is, is the virus ta takes, uh, only takes prisoners. <laughs> they, 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 uh, the virus doesn't discriminate. You know, the virus crosses borders. The virus knows all the languages. And the virus can do that. And, and that's true of, of uh, global warming or climate change, flooding. It's true of poverty. It's true of all the consequences of neglect of, of the earth, of our environment, of our population. And, and the, so this is a great teaching moment. Yes, the lesson of this plague is that we're all vulnerable. You can't build that gated community, that little island. You could take your yacht out, but where the hell are you going to land it? You've got your yacht out there and, and you suddenly got some uh, the virus somehow got in there through one of the underpaid people you got working for you maybe you know didn't get tested or whatever where are you going to dock your yacht you know what are you going to do with it nobody wants it you know and they don't care if it's some exploited filipino uh cook in the kitchen who gave it to you you're stuck you know and so yes there is a, an incredible democratic lesson experience in this existential moment that our survival does depend on a very strong commitment to human justice. Yes, it does. You can't deny it. You know, it's there. And it's a lesson that came from the dark side of Mother Nature. Yes, it can. Our, our whole existence has been questioned now, you know, like it's never been questioned. Never. You know, this thing could get out of hand. It could come back. It could come back in a more virulent form, you know. And it's just one of the many things about the human condition that could deny that condition. Snuff it out. And for the first time in my 84 years, or at least since the, I was two, when I was relatively conscious, and I've lived through a lot, I'm aware 
I'm, I've been in prison in my very nice condo for five weeks now. My wife has a serious health condition. I'm of the age group that's vulnerable. And you know what? Uh, I don't want to, I'm a, more of an activist now than I ever been. I don't want to see business going back to, to normal. And however, let me pick up a really important point that I haven't stressed. You know, the point you made going back to your own NSA experience, and I'd like to ask you questions about that. I think you put your finger on, a finger on the main problem. The lesson of human experience, as I've been suggesting all along, is that not given a humane, enlightened road, fair, social justice road to human survival, to security, security, people will take the dark side. I call Trump, uh, his rhetoric, the rhetoric of neo-fascism. Because when he's baiting Mexicans, undocumented people, uh, women, whatever he's baiting, you know, uh, when he's baiting them, that's the dark side of the human condition. People will go for the scapegoating. They'll go for the coercive. And that's why right now, a lot of people in China must think, hey, you know, this use of the surveillance technology is a good thing. It lets us know when we shouldn't walk out in the street. It lets us know when somebody approaches us who wasn't tested or had the illness and the cops will come and they'll arrest that person and they'll make me go back in my house or they'll find me. And that's going to be a very popular model, you know, and, and all of the lessons we learned from Snowden and Julian Assange and everybody else, Chelsea Manning and so forth, you know, uh, are going to be swept aside and people are going to say, bring on, bring on the coercive totalitarian state, only hide the coercive part. Bring on the Internet uh, uh, revelations of you, what everything you do and what you read and what you think so we can get the people who are not acting properly, not wearing the mask, not doing this. We can uh, thin the herd that way, you know. And so it is, it's quite ominous. We live in a truly ominous time. But as I say, it's also a time for education and organizing because there is a solution. And the solution is responsibility to the least among us, to the most vulnerable, caring, helpful, what pe medical people are doing on the front line, being concerned, being considerate, and recognizing we're all in this together. So that's the most powerful argument against coercion and lock them up. No, take care of them. Don't lock them up. Treat them. The guys and I love doing the podcast, being able to share our experiences in the military with allies and supporters means the world to us, but we can't do all the work. We need you to share an episode of ours with somebody, anyone whom you think might be affected by it. Maybe a young person looking to join the military or parents advocating for one, uh, conscientious citizens who care about the violence the U.S. wages in their name, advocates for women and people of color who understand the harsh environment the military can create for minorities and also inflicts on minorities across the globe, and anyone else you think it might affect. Please take a minute and share this with them. Now, our podcast is supported in a few different ways. First, there's Patreon, where we're blessed to have an array of wonderful supporters helping the guys and I pay for some of the podcast's expenses. Those who contribute $10 a month or more will be mentioned here as an honorary producer, helping keep you, our listeners, stocked with new episodes. But you don't have to contribute $10 a month to help us. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help us keep going, paying for hosting and storage fees, transcribing old and new episodes, promoting and expanding the podcast, and other crap I can't think of right now. So let's bring out these honorary producers, and they are Will Arends, Gage Counts, Fahim Shirazi, Henry Zamoda, James O'Barr, Adam Bellows, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, and the Status Quo Podcast. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you very much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill.
Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt. The great Bill Kropinski did an awesome job designing our first shirt, which you can find at shop.spreadshirt.com forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Check for promo codes before you order. And now, let's get back to the podcast. Well, you know, uh, Bob, you brought up Eugene Debs earlier, and you know, you know full well that he's he's kind of my guy, and you know, I wear a T-shirt with this quote on it, and it's on my Twitter, and I'm constantly, you know, it's in my book, and I, you know, always talk about his famous, you know, at his sentencing when he said, you know, uh, as long as there is an underclass, I'm in it; so long as there's a criminal element, I'm of it; so long as there's a soul in prison, I am not free. And and over the years, people have said to me, you know, come on, isn't that isn't that highly idealist? That's ridiculous. I mean, prisoners are bad and all this. And then, but I think you make the point, you know, and I'm just going to kind of leave it there, but you make the point, look, so long as there's uninsured and poor folks, I can get the disease from them. So long as there's prisoners, they can spread it throughout Rikers Island. And prisoners are literally trying to jump over the walls to get away from, you know, to get away from this disease. So I think it really has brought out the inherent truth in that, which I, which I think is in, incredibly valuable. So I'm going to let uh, Henry close it out. I know he has one more uh, sort of, you know, future journalism question. Um, and then I think we will uh, let you go so that, uh, so that these guys can get to their, uh, get to their lives and, and Sam can come by in a little bit. But uh, Henry, why don't, you, uh, why don't you close us out? All right. I um, have a quote here I'd like to read first. Quote, the columnists and bloggers of Truth Dig chart an ecosystem in irreversible decline, follow human rights crises and repression overseas, and probe the erosion of American democracy by perpetual war, the disappearance of privacy rights, the abandonment of the poor, and a political system enthralled to corporate titans, gross polluters, and Wall Street crooks. By pursuing these subjects with an intellectual rigor and relentlessness seldom found on the web, Truth Dig has become one of the most critically acclaimed internet-based news sites in the world." End quote. So, in watching your documentary, I was really struck by your discussion with William F. Buckley, and specifically the comment you made about communists being considered by Buckley and those of his standing as a quote-unquote non-person among many other criticisms you laid out in that discussion of red baiting the House on an American Activities Committee, etc. I find the American penchant for ignorance like this particularly disappointing, but I'm more struck by your commitment to finding and even creating a home for these fleeing voices. I don't personally agree with much that comes from the mouth of Sam Harris, but I absolutely support and applaud your choice to publish his pieces from an atheist point of view. Truth Dig has been a, an amazing resource for myself and becoming more skeptical and cautious in how I view the actions of the U.S. government and most especially the lens through which I view my time uh, deployed in the Middle East. Looking back on your time at Truth Dig, what would you say is your greatest achievement and what would you say is your greatest failure? Also, what advice would you give to myself and other budding activists and our desire to ensure that marginalized voices are heard. Wow. Um, I, my first response is to say that freedom is an accident. Uh, that the, unfortunately, the normal human drive is primarily for security, for safe space, to be part of a herd that is taken care of. I think that's been pretty well documented. I mean, we talked before about Cuba, for instance. And I remember one very painful moment when I was in Havana and I saw that Cuban society was not going in a direction that I welcomed. Uh, that because of the Bay of Pigs, because of U.S. hostility, I do blame it on U.S. foreign policy. I saw that most people that I encountered or I knew wanted a stronger government, not a weaker one. And I remember walking with a friend of mine in Havana who was an American and who had 
gotten very involved with Cuba early, and he went there, he worked there, and so forth. And some people came up asking for money, begging in, in Havana in the old quarter. And he was angry with them. And I said, why are you angry with them? I wanted to give him money. And he said, because we have programs. And, and they shouldn't be there. And they're giving a bad image. And there are ways of dealing with this. And I said, but I said, but they don't feel it's working for them. And they don't know how to do it. They don't want to do it. It doesn't fit. And right now, they're hungry. Why shouldn't they express that? And this was a guy I grew up with in the Bronx. And he said, because it creates disorder and it hurts everybody else. And I thought, you know, on a little tiny level, that's really what it's all about. You know, it goes to people in jail. If you don't see them as yourself, you think they were obviously guilty. You think their system gave them the right opportunities. You think they failed and somehow they're there. Uh, it goes back to an issue about how the anti-war movement, which we by the way have not discussed, should have treated people who were conscripts in the American army, say, during Vietnam. And I thought, always thought one of the false charges was that somehow the anti-war movement in the main was hostile to returning vets. And I bet if someone could do a really good study of that, you'd find that whatever hostility there was about baby killers or something came from agent provocateurs. Because in my memory and my activism, I know Jane Fonda and Tom Hayden started the coffee shops near bases to reach GIs. I know uh, that in the work that, that we were, that I ever did, there was a recognition that these people who were, even when they were volunteers, let alone the draftees, were trapped into a system. And that if you wanted to really understand what was going on, you had to get inside their experience, their had their knowledge base and who they were. And that is true of the homeless issue. It's true of prisoners. It's true of understanding people of a different gender, sexual preference, race, background, or so forth. And the way we ignore that uh, and divide and conquer uh, is given to us by people of power to marginalize anyone who is expressing opposition and saying it's not working for them. I know Danny alluded to the way I felt when I was in the Bronx to people in Staten Island. Uh, you know, there was religious differences and ethnic differences and so forth. And, and so this is not something new. It happens on every level. And, and I think what has to happen is to recognize, and it, it sound, it's not just what Danny said. Yes, if they get sick, it hurts us. But if, if they get sick, somebody that is just like us is hurting. If they get sick, somebody's a son, you know, or a cousin or something, or father is hurting. And I know in that movie, there's a, a reference because my father took me down to the Bowery in New York to show me uh, the homeless, out-of-work people of that time, of the Depression. He didn't take me out down there to say, if you don't work hard, you'll be just like them. Because he was of the left. He wasn't of the right. And he didn't tell me they had the wrong skin color or the wrong religion or the wrong thing. He said, they are a consequence of failed policy. They are a consequence of disproportionate power in the society. They are a consequence of moral indifference, contempt, immorality in the society. And I think the positive thing that is happening here now, uh, picking up on your, the earlier point, is that the virus reminds us not only of we got to worry about the homeless person because they'll give us the illness. But the virus reminds us, first of all, most of us are trapped in our homes. Some are trapped in better accommodating homes with a backyard, and others are trapped in more crowded homes where keeping six feet or not going out to get food is more problematic. 
uh, you know, uh, my own, one of my sons works uh, at, at uh, a, a, a store selling food and has to wear a mask, is at risk, but also brings us food, uh, keeps us going. So I think, yes, uh, Major Danny's right. We've been reminded of our own vulnerability, uh, that we are the natives that are being hurt uh, by the genocide or whatever, the scourge, and we are vulnerable. But also, I think it reminds us a little bit about what other people endure all the time. Uh, the fear, the illness, the risk, all the time. The crime, uh, the lack of services, uh, you know, uh, not getting the ventilator when they need it, not getting the medical treatment when they need it. So it is a reminder of our common humanity. Now, let me get to the truth dig hot potato that you handed me. Uh, and we are going through troubles at truth dig. And uh, there will be court sessions and so forth. So I'm really not at liberty in a honest way, a uh, full way, full way, I want to be honest, to discuss it. But I would say truth dig, like ramparts, like the when I was able to do good work at the LA Times, when I was able to do good work even at Playboy, whatever one's criticisms of it, you know, I could do some good interviews and some good articles and so forth. I don't think that freedom, even though you have a constitution and limited power, that freedom can ever be assumed as the natural course of things. It is just too easy to find reasons to snuff out individual freedom, to regard it as a threat, you know, fire in the theater, to talk about why, yes, it's a wonderful idea, but we can't do it right now. Now, you guys are from the military. You know the military is built on the idea that individual expression and thought is a threat to unity and to the mission. That's the whole idea of, of military. Uh, I remember in my own fight with my draft board where I remained uh, eligible for the draft until I, I don't know what the age was, 35, 36, was I said I wasn't a draft resistor. I said, I want to go in. I believe there are justifiable wars. I'm willing to serve. But I want to uh, tell you, I believe in the Nuremberg principle. If you give me an order that's immoral, I will not follow it. I will not commit a war crime. On that basis, they didn't want to adjudicate it. They didn't want a trial. But on that basis, I was held in limbo. And uh, it seemed to me for a long time there, almost every year, when I was a graduate student, I was living in the Bay Area, I had to go to the Presidio. They usually pick some horrible time at 11 o'clock at night or keep me there until 3 in the morning, asking me what this meant and was I a psychiatric problem. But I think the issue is pretty clear. And it's not just in the military. All functioning societies hold out a bribe. The bribe is we can do more for you. We can make life. This is what was happening on that night in Havana. We can make life easier for you, better for you. You don't have to see a homeless person yelling incoherently. And you don't have to be reminded of poverty. Uh, you don't have to be confronted about the consequence of waging these wars that you treat as a video game. Uh, you know, we, we have a bargain to be made with you that we will provide, and this is what those dystopian novels are all about, we will provide you with order and toys and, and uh, ability to relax and be secure and be admired and flattered and everything else if you stop your questioning at the border of national security, of law and order, of uh, safety, uh, real or imagined, uh, dealing with the enemy, real or imagined. And if you follow our rules, we will create this grand illusion of individual freedom. And this goes back to the founding of the society. After all, we had urban poor who protested and they were thrown in jail. You know, we had slaves who tried to find freedom and they were hung from trees, you know, and going up right through segregation, which after all is not ancient history. 
Uh, it happens now in small towns where you have a bullying sheriff. It happens in big cities where you have a racist police force. You know, it happened in, uh, you know, in the Midwest and it happens in, uh, in the New England states. So basically, the exercise of freedom is always uh, an exercise of um, contradiction, uh, using space that's available, going through that light, coming through that crack and everything, uh, of taking advantage of opportunities to express, taking risks. And uh, when I was doing Truth Dig, I deluded myself with the statement I would tell audiences, uh, freedom of press, as Sleeping says, is guaranteed only to those who own one. And I own half of one now. Well, it turned that was not quite the case, or we'll have to see to what degree that was the case. But that's been true wherever I've been. I had a lot of freedom at the LA Times. I got to interview uh, uh, George Walker Bush, and I got to interview Richard Nixon and a lot of people. But at a certain point, uh, that freedom was not so convenient to the Chicago Tribune organization uh, that had taken over the LA Times. It was inconvenient. Uh, they didn't want it. It wasn't part of their mix. Or maybe they didn't like what I was saying about media concentration and they were trying to buy the papers so they could also get the local television stations. Or maybe they didn't like us. One of them, the Polish publisher they appointed, said, I, he, I never wrote a word that he liked. So probably that was my criticism of the Iraq war from the very beginning. And that was probably the main reason I was pushed out. So anytime you find yourself in a situation as a citizen in any society, undocumented or documented, I'm saying you're present in any society, you're going to be faced with a choice to what degree do you speak up for the larger social good when it's inconvenient to your personal career or well-being. And you guys know this better than I do. I know more about Major Danny, but certainly he experienced that when he was an officer commanding troops. He's written about it quite eloquently. But we find that in every aspect of our life. We find that when we're teaching in a school and we feel we want to raise something with the school or the students that's inconvenient to their assembly of power. And it boils down, you know, in a, in a society that has the trappings and the illusion of freedom, which ours certainly still does, the trappings and illusions, uh, and most of the time you can avoid the confrontation that being a free, independent uh, member of that society demands. Most of the time, of course, you know, they're not going to pull out your fingernails. They're not going to smash your testicles, probably, unless you're black and poor and in the wrong jail cell, uh, and they can get away with it. But most of the time, it'll be a kink in your uh, uh, career curve, or it'll be maybe a loss of jobs. You know, uh, there are people who resigned uh, from truth. Not didn't resign; they went on strike at Truth Dig, and they ended up losing their income, their job, uh, and they needed those jobs. You know, and so you know, I respect that, but I know those are difficult choices. You know, you got a child you're taking care of and you got to feed and you got rent to pay and your fellow workers go out on strike. That happens all over uh, the world or they challenge a wrong and uh, you take a stand in solidarity with them. And, you know, it doesn't work out well and certainly not in the short run, maybe not in the long run, you know. And so my view about Truth Dig is my view about any publishing venture I've ever been involved with, freedom of the press, not only uh, is guaranteed to only those who own one, the only way you have freedom of the press is if people will take advantage of whatever cracks there are in the system and speak truth to power. And it'll the cracks and the mechanisms will be different. Sometimes it'll be somebody screaming on a street corner. Sometimes it'll be a high school teacher uh, taking, uh, risking their career and talking to their students honestly. Get them to read Major Danny's book if it ever gets published. I hope it does. 
He's writing another one on patriotism, which is going to be published by Hay Day Press. I hope it's uh, used widely in the schools. Some teacher who uses Major Danny's book on patriotism, questioning, as George Washington did, as Dwight Eisenhower did, questioning uh, the limits or the contradictions of the slogan of patriotism, that high school teacher might get fired for uh, signing Major Danny's book. And, uh, you know, uh, there it is. And when I think about Truth Dig, the thing that gave me greatest pleasure was being able to print the words of, of Major Danny, of Julian Assange, of uh, Chelsea Manning, or bring people, remind them of what was going on. Uh, the greatest achievement of Truth Dig was Kevin Tillman, the guy who served alongside his brother, Pat Tillman, uh, in Afghanistan, first in Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, there's nothing, and it also put us on the map it also was the main thing that brought Truth Dig to the attention of a large audience and helped us win uh, five or six Webbies. I lost track and a lot of other awards, the leading press awards, Sigma Delta Chi awards that our cartoonist, Mr. Fish, won twice. And I won for my columns on the housing meltdown, on the failure of the Obama administration, uh, columns and articles that Chris Hedges and, uh, you know, a lot of people wrote. Uh, uh, Ellen Brown, the good stuff on the banking. I could go down the list. But the most significant thing we ever printed was by uh, uh, Kevin Tillman, who was uh, played in the, you know, his brother was the famous football player, uh, played for the Card Arizona Cardinals and uh, Arizona State before that. But uh, Kevin was in the Cleveland Indian farm system as a baseball player. They both signed up after 9-11 because they said uh, people who have careers and have other jobs should also volunteer. They come from a family of people who has served in the military. And they said they had an obligation uh, to go. Uh, they didn't believe in the Iraq war. They were independent thinkers, but they were sent to, they joined the Rangers. They didn't take a, a commission position and be used as a recruiter, which is what the Pentagon wanted. Uh, no, they said, we're going to go in and, you know, and take this training. Uh, they were sent to Iraq. They didn't believe in it. They were involved in the so-called freeing, uh, you know, of Jessica Lynch, which was one of the big lies about the whole Iraq war, this truly heroic woman, but she wasn't heroic uh, because she fired her gun in Rambo style. That was a Pentagon concocted story. Actually, the people in the Iraqi hospital had been very uh, uh, courageous in helping her, and she was incredibly courageous in writing an honest book about it, uh, Jessica Lynch. Everybody should read that book. You know, I wasn't the female Rambo, but she was a, a true hero in, in telling the truth about her experience. Well, Pat and Kevin Tillman were involved in that supposed freeing uh, of, of Jessica Lynch when, in fact, you know, we had stopped, the U.S. had stopped the ambulance that had her and everything else had distorted the whole thing. Uh, and then they were sent, they didn't believe in the Iraq war, but they were there. And then they were sent to Afghanistan. Before they went to Afghanistan, they were told, you don't have to go. We'll use you for recruiting. We'll put you in this position. You'll go on television. They said, bull. We're not going to do, do that. And uh, Pat Tillman and Kevin Tillman were actually influenced by Noam Chomsky. They had read his work, and they and he even carried a couple of his books with him and shared them with his fellow GIs. I know a lot about this story because when I was still a columnist at the LA Times, I started looking with suspicion at the narrative that was being presented about Tillman's death, the denial that it was from friendly fire, meaning your own side, but rather, uh, you know, spinning another heroic mythology. He was a hero, and so was his brother, Kevin, but they were heroes because they were trying to do the right thing and risking their lives when they didn't have to. Uh, but nonetheless, I'll, I'll never forget the phone call I got. <laughs> I'm going to stop there, uh, but just to say that Mary Tillman, Mary Danny Tillman, their mother called me up. The switchboard operator said, I have someone who claims to be Pat Tillman's mother on the phone, and she wants to talk to you. I thought she was calling to yell at me. You know, if it was really her, it was her, 
and she was calling from Almaden outside of San Jose, and she was calling to thank me, thank me for the call. And uh, she asked me if I wanted to see the papers. And because my wife was the deputy editor of the San Francisco Chronicle, I asked a great investigative reporter, I said, can I bring her? And she said, yeah, of course. And then we spent a lot of time and my wife ended up writing a book with Danny Tillman, uh, Boots on the Ground. People should read that book about the death of Pat Tillman and uh, Kevin Tillman. Uh, when we started, uh, we had Truth Dick. Kevin Tillman uh, was willing to uh, uh, write a piece for us on uh, remembering Pat Tillman and what had been done to him. And that became the most important thing Truth Dick ever ran, ever. And yes, I'm glad that we had the opportunity to print that story. Uh, am I shocked that we're not in business now? No. And I think the primary reason we're, that I'm not going to go into all the details, but I think we dared, and I think I had to push back pretty hard on the new Cold War of blaming Putin for somehow Hillary's defeat and the rise of Donald Trump. And that became a big issue. Were we going to tr try to do reporting, or are we going to carry water for the Democratic National Committee and blame Julian Assange and uh, blame Putin or something uh, for giving us the papers that get, told us what Hillary Clinton said in her speeches to Goldman Sachs, uh, which only got revealed because they were made available by uh, WikiLeaks. Uh, and were we going to learn what Podesta did at the Democratic National Committee to undermine Bernie Sanders? I thought that was great journalism. I thought we had a right to know. And I would, as editor in chief of Truth Dig, I refused to sign on to the narrative that somehow. Uh, Trump is president because of Julian Assange and Putin. I think it's nonsense. I think Trump got to be president because Hillary Clinton had a deaf ear to the pain and suffering of so many Americans, and Trump was able to exploit it and to engage in old-fashioned McCarthyism and red-baiting to explain the last election, I thought was lousy journalism. And while some of our columnists embraced that, and I never censored them, the real issue was uh, that as a publication, we were open to questioning that narrative. And actually, it's the thing that we did at Truth Dig that I'm in many ways uh, most proud of that we did not join the chorus of, uh, <coughs> of MSNBC and, you know, blame all the problems of the country on, uh, on Russiagate. But uh, that w I felt we had a right to, and an obligation to do that as journalists. And I do think that became uh, a, 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 the real issue. And uh, so there it is. Well, Bob, um... You know, I, I started reading Truth Dig, and, and we'll kind of close with this, in, um, in Afghanistan, quite frankly. I mean, so we're talking 2011, you know, long before you knew me or, or I knew you or you would have ever heard of my little, you know, sandbagged life that I was leading. And uh, and it was clear even then, you know, before Russia came, before that the, the Truth Dig was going was gonna to do journalism. Right, rather than than uh, carrying water, and it, it was it was really incredible for me when you when you did take me on to do some writing for Truth Dig, uh, I was just honored because I had been a reader first, you know, which was really incredible. And uh, you know, I, I appreciate you taking so much time with us today, and we covered so much great uh, material. And don't you know, you kept saying, you know, oh, I'm going on too long. You know, this is stuff people need to hear, and and I'm glad that. You're right. The internet does give us this space on the podcast to do it. But, uh, you know, I know that whatever you do next is going to be important. Uh, you're doing, uh, sh check out listeners, uh, sheerpost.com. Uh, Bob's been, you know, doing some writing and posting some writers uh, on, on his own uh, blog and, and, and site, which is picking up some good stuff and not, not just mine. Uh, and then also the Sheer Intelligence podcast. Check that out. And, uh, and Bob, you know, it, it, the thing that strikes me about you that I'll, that I'll end with as I thank you is that in the above the fold documentary, it's clear to me that it, it's probably ar almost harder for you to be on the side that you are answering the questions right now, because you probably have a thousand questions for us for another time. And maybe you'll have some of the guys on, uh, on the podcast, but 
you said everyone has a story and that you never thought the powerful folks story was more important. Uh, and hearing you talk about Kevin Tillman, hearing you talk about your parents or the, the, the people begging in Cuba, it really doesn't matter. You've always cared about the story that makes you a real journalist and to me, uh, a real human being. And, uh, and, and I don't say that lightly. And so I'm just thankful that I got to know you and that uh, you agreed to give some time to us. And I know that our listeners are going to appreciate it. So, Bob, I just want to thank you one more time for coming on. Thank you. Okay. Bob. And thank you, guys. You know what Ron Kovic always says? I never fully understood it. You remember he told you, Major, he said, I thank you for your service. Yeah, yeah, it uh, blew my uh, mind when he said that. Yeah. You know, and uh, Ron Kovic, uh, let me just end on this. The reason I really wanted to talk to you guys, not to romanticize it or anything else, but Ron Kovic is the most exceptional human being I've ever met in my life, bar none, bar none. You know, uh, and to see him imprisoned, really, in, 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 in his frozen three quarters of his body, what he's been through, and I'm not talking about the movie, I met this guy when I first met him at a, a, a Vets for Peace rally, we ended up at the uh, graveyard in Westwood, the Sem Veterans Cemetery. And then the whole crowd left, and I was there with Ron Kovic in his wheelchair. And this is before the movie was made. I think it was 1970. And we just sat there way late. You know, there weren't, I guess, any caretakers. We were there for hours i don't know how we even got out of there and it was the single most moving experience of my life and what it brought home is you know it's not a chess game it's not a video game it's not policy wonks it's not talking heads it's not scoring points you know it's not one-upmanship but decisions that are made not just about war and peace, but certainly, most definitely about war and peace, but about the economy, about health care, about everything, have this dramatic effect, powerful, crushing, brutalizing effect on human beings. And the whole point of journalism, the whole point of guaranteeing the sanctity of journalism and not attacking it the way Trump does, you can tack individual stories, it's your right. But the, the craft of journalism, the obligation of journalism, and it's the slogan I use, is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, and we don't even know who said that originally. But the power of journalism, and that's what you guys are doing right now, however you do it, is basically a redress of grievances. And to remind people whether it's through their apathy or their selling out or their going along with the powerful of the consequences of this thing called policy, of politics, of decision-making. And that is a guy like Ron Kovic, bless him, and his courage and everything, that is right now, you know, trying to survive in Redondo Beach, you know, in this crisis, how the hell is he getting food? Is the person who has to yank him out of his wheelchair and put a crane and lift him into his bed going to show up or not show up? Maybe he's got the virus. Maybe the VA forgot about him. That's what this war peace discussion boils down to. It's Ron Kovic. And that's what's so great about what you guys are doing. And I want to say, because one a really person I know is Major Danny. I hope they'll get to know the other, the other guys. But you have been, for me, the first person really since Ron Kovic to understand that consequence and to convey it. I shouldn't say the only one to understand. I'm sure plenty of people do. But to take on the obligation, despite or maybe because of your privileged West Point position, your rank as a major, your uh, laudatory treatment in certain circles, if you just went with that and going back to be a teacher. And to my mind that you felt as a teacher and as a writer, you had an obligation to talk about the true consequence of, of, of this so-called policy of this chess game, of this video game, 
I can't tell you how I, I, I just can't express this uh, strongly enough. So again, another long spiel, but thanks for giving me the opportunity. Take care. Well, well thanks, Bob. I appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we can do it again soon. Hopefully the situation will get better and we won't have to do it again soon. Yeah, hopefully I'll be out in L.A. <laughs> okay. Take care. <laughs> All right. Talk to you soon, Bob. Bye. We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill and also at Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify. You name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. And listen to my song. I hope you'll pay attention. I will not detain.